Parivardhini uh, to introduce her. It's like she's a well-known face in glaucoma. Uh, she is from Shankarnitra, like uh, uh, Chennai, and I have known her since her postgraduate days because, fortunately, we are from the same institute. Uh, Bangalore Medical College, Minto Hospital. And she, later she did her fellowship in Shankar Netrale, and she has numerous publications and presentations and different forums. And is a, she's a favorite teacher at her, correct, at, at her current institute. So let's see, let's learn accurate gonioscopy from Dr. Parivardini. Thank, thank you, Ravi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, your slide yeah. is visible. Oh, slide's visible, audible. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, AOS, for giving me this opportunity, and thank you, Ravi, for this kind invitation. I'll be speaking about gonioscopy, how to do it accurately, and how to accurately interpret the findings. So we know that uh, the two major forms of glaucoma, the open angle and angle closure glaucoma, can be differentiated only by the assessment of the anterior chamber angle, that is by gonioscopy. The primary treatment of both these conditions are different. You would need a peripheral iridotomy in the angle closure glaucoma patients and a medication should be started in open angle glaucoma patient. So the primary treatment is different. So we have to differentiate these two major forms of glaucoma. So gonioscopy is nothing but a clinical technique used to examine the structures of the anterior chamber angle. So it is a part of comprehensive eye checkup, and then it is important in the diagnosis of glaucoma to differentiate between the various spectrum of primary angle closure disease and secondary glaucoma. So before doing the procedure, how to properly do this procedure, you have to explain the procedure to the patient and make sure that the patient is seated comfortably. And we have to apply topical anesthetics and the examiner's hand should be supported well so that there is no undue pressure on the cornea. The patient should be asked to look straight and the lateral canthus should be at the lateral canthus level marker. And if the examiner is using a handle gonioscope, the gonioscope should be held closer to the lens. The room should be dimly lit. The slit lamp illumination should be minimal and the beam height should be minimum. That is up two to three millimeters. If you are using a non-handle gonioscope like the Zeiss or a Sussman, uh, the examiner should, the free fingers, that is a middle finger should be at the headband and the other two fingers are the cheek, which is well supported. Again, so that uh, undue pressure on the eye is not applied. These are the various gonioscopes available. The upper ones are the Cobes, Barkins, Swan Jacob, the Morris lens are all direct gonioscopes. By direct, we mean that if we are examining the angle, superior angle, we are seeing the superior angle only. So we get an erect images with these lenses. The Cope's lens is used for diagnostic gonioscopy mainly in children. The Barkin, Swan, Jacob and Mori lenses are used intraoperatively for angle procedures. The below ones are all indirect gonio mirrors. The Goldman 3 mirror is the prototype. We have the indentation mirrors, the Posner, Zeiss and Sussman. We mean indirect, these are mirrors, so the images will be inverted. So this would exam, uh, explain it clearly. So if you are examining the superior angle, we will be seeing the inferior mirror. So what we see at 12 o'clock will be seen at 6 o'clock. But it is not laterally reversed. So what we see on the right-hand side will remain on the right-hand side. What we see on the left-hand side will remain on the left-hand side. So when we put a gonioscope inside the eye, these are the normal structures seen in gonioscopy. The posterior most structure is the root of the iris, followed by the gray colored ciliary body band, then follows the white colored scleral spur, the pigmented trabecular meshwork, and then the anterior non-pigmented trabecular meshwork, then the schwal baseline. However, ciliary body band might not be seen in all patients. So mostly whatever, what often we see is the scleral spur as the posterior most structure. Here we see the scleral spur here, followed by the pigmented trabecular meshwork, the anteriorly non-pigmented trabecular meshwork. And then we see another brown line here, anterior to the schwal baseline, which is sort of wavy and uh, sort of irregularly pigmented. This is called the sampolysis line. So it lies actually anterior to the schwal baseline and usually seen in heavily pigmented eyes. The trabecular meshwork is a major landmark in gonioscopy, whether to say it's open or closed but sometimes in young patients we see this faint tm pigmentation so we are not able to say if these angles are open or closed so in these situations the corneal wedge technique helps here what we do is we create a thin slit of uh, light which is uh, maximally illuminated and when the illumination is offset a little bit that is inclined we create two separate corneal reflections so the anterior and the posterior surface of the cornea 
and they intersect at the schwal base line so if the distance between the iris root and the schwal base line is more you know that the angle is open but if you are not able to see this intersection if it is dipping into the iris root you know that the angle is not open this can be done in the superior and inferior angle however for the nasal and the temporal angles this might be slightly difficult and not possible so when we put the gonioscope various structures can be seen but we usually grade it by the posterior and most structure we see so in the first three figures we can see that here the ciliary body band is seen here posteriorly the scleral spur is seen here the posterior trabecular meshwork is seen all these first three pictures show that the angle is open this picture shows a sample is line that is the schwal base line here here no angle structures are seen so these two picture show us that these angles are not open so also we have to pay attention to the iris contour this picture shows that the iris contour is flat this is convex this is showing a plateau iris configuration which is showing a double wave sign here the iris is concave so once we examine the patient in the primary position without compression next we have to do indentation gonioscopy where we compress the central part of the cornea so that the aqueous is displaced peripherally into the angle and pushes the iris backwards so in this picture we can see that the angles are completely closed we cannot see angle structures the corneal which is again dipping into the iris root but in the second picture we can see that the angle is open here with compression the posterior and most structure seen here is the scleral spur we can also observe here the double hump sign so with this indentation gonioscopy we have opened up this with see a brown structure here a cursory examination would say that this angle is open but when you do indentation gonioscopy we see that whatever we saw here is actually not the trabecular meshwork the trabecular is this structure and what we were considering trabecular meshwork was a pigmented schwal base line so even if we see a pigmented trabecular meshwork or see a structure similar to it but shallow you see always indent and see if you are not missing a sample is line as trabecular meshwork if we don't have an indentation gonioscope with a three mirror or a single mirror goldmans um, lens we can also do a manipulative gonioscopy to see the over the hill view ask the patient to look into the mirror or we can shift the lens to the angle where we want to see we will be able to look over the iris and into the angle so this can be done in non indentation gonioscope this picture we can see that the angle is closed completely closed and we are not able to see any angle structure the second picture with indentation shows some part of the angles which are open showing that they are open till the scleral spur but the temporal part we can see that it is not opening and these are areas closed by peripheral anterior synecae so peripheral anterior synecae can be very broad based they can be filling some part of the angle they can be focal with some areas of the angle seen in between or they can be completely closing the angles like this so in these situations identification of peripheral anterior synecae is not very difficult but when you have focal gonio synecae like this very tiny gonio synecae peripheral anterior synecae they have to be differentiated from iris processes because they look little similar how to differentiate from them these peripheral anterior synecae they will look tented triangular that is they will have a broad base if you look at the iris process here all they are all slender they will be here they will be broad base and they will not follow the concavity of the angle iris processes will follow the concavity of the angle and uh, when you try to indent the iris will not be going back in when you have gonio synecae but the iris will go back when you have iris process so it is very important to differentiate these two conditions because peripheral anterior synecae is a pathological condition and iris processes is a physiological condition thick band of iris processes can be seen in axenfeld rigers anomaly where you will have anterior detached schwal base line and iris process will be stuck to the uh, schwal base line indentation gonioscopy will also give us an idea if this patient has plateau iris we'll see a double hum sign the posterior most hump will be because of the anteriorly rotated ciliary body and the second hump will be because of the lens edge so again we can uh, diagnose plateau iris configuration with the indentation gonioscope sometimes we can see this patchy tm pigmentation trabecular meshwork pigmentation when we do gonioscopy whenever we see them we should uh, think of 
intermittent iridotrabellar contact which is occurring in them. So these eyes are at risk of angle closure. When pigmentation is seen uniformly densely like this in all the angles, especially the superior angle, we should think of pigment dispersion syndrome where sometimes if the Krukenberg spindle is very faint, we might be missing it on slit lamp examination. Once we look at the angle, then we'll go back and look at the endothelium, whether the spindle is there. And this is a hallmark of pigment dispersion syndrome. Densely pigmented trabecular meshua can also be seen in pseudo-exfoliation patients. Sometimes pseudo-exfoliating material can also be seen in the angle. These eyes are also at risk of angle closure because of the zonal laxity, the lens will move forward and you can end up with angle closure. In patients with neovascular glaucoma, new vessels can be seen in the angle even before we see them in the iris. So these are fine branching vessels which will bridge over the angle. And sometimes you can see peripheral anterior sinicae also developing in them. And uh, this should be differentiated from normal angle vessels. The normal angle vessels will be radially oriented. They will never cross the scleral spur and they're non-branching, thick vessels so when we see finely branching can i request vessels, you to please sum up yeah sure so there are various things you can look for the patency of the trap stoma silicon oil in the angle can be seen and uh, inflammatory glaucomas we'll see inflammatory debris or kps in the angle foreign body can also be seen in the angle angle recession in post-traumatic patients with blunt trauma can be visualized with CD cleft also can be seen where we will see a white area in the angle. So blood inch limbs cannot should not be confused with neovascularization of the angle. Here we don't see any vessels. So other modalities are the red cams, NGS, goniopen. So come some common mistakes which can occur are when we press too much on the cornea or if the gonioscope is not kept parallel to the iris plane, you can get bubbles. Sometimes we can artifactually open up the angle also, which is which has angle closure. So I would like to say it's an important part of ophthalmic evaluation. It is an art, so it has to be practiced to, le to be learned. But though we have so many imaging modalities, gonioscopy is still the gold standard for angle evaluation. Thank Thanks a lot, Dr. Parvidri for excellent talk. Uh, I know you're getting late for your operation theater work, yeah. but uh, uh, can we have a few questions before we... Like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. So in case we have to opt for any other instruments, suppose the patient doesn't allow to do gonio or suppose some such a situation is there, then is there any other instrument you would, which you would consider as a second best as a, or as a replacement to gonio in certain specific situations? I know it is irre irreplaceable, but still... Yeah. Anti-segment OCT or anything like based on article. Yeah, yeah. The, the anti-segment OCT can be done. UBM definitely will require patient's cooperation. If patient is not allowing you to do gonioscopy, definitely UBM and anti-segment OCT can be done in them. Okay. Hmm. Dr. Supriya, Dr. Alkesh, if there is any question, we can ask now because she will be leaving the meeting now. Uh, I'll ask one more question. There are some people who say that they are able to get very good results with based on their uh, like a two mirror or three mirror gonio and they don't want to shift to four mirror gonio. So do you think that the result that we get with the two mirror or a three mirror gonio is almost equivalent to like when we think about indentation result? Is it same or I think like what do you think is the uh, like best for doing gonio? Mm, so again, I would say many people don't use four mirror gonioscopes, indentation gonioscopes. They have been very comfortable doing manipulative gonioscopy. So if you ask me what to shift over to, the indentation gonioscopies are the best ones. Yeah. But uh, people do get good results. They have been doing for decades with single mirror and three mirrors. They have been getting good results with that. So what they're comfortable with, they are using it. But if, uh, if students are starting to learn, I would ask them to sh shift over to our indentation gonioscopes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vardhani, for taking part in our uh, IC and taking out your valuable time from your busy, busy schedule. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.